Okay, for all of you people out in Facebook land, um, I'm sorry it took me <laughs> this long to get logged in and now here we are. I hope each one of you is doing well, uh, blessed in what God is doing in your life and thank you for joining us here on Oral Baptist Church Facebook page. We are continuing our study of Lamentations, and I trust that the Scriptures, God's Word, will be a blessing to each one of us as we walk through this process. Okay? Um, we're going to start in, um, right now, I, as I said, um, I apologize for being late, but... We are starting in Lamentations chapter 3 and beginning in verse 31. Okay? So, as we turn in our Bibles to Lamentations 3.31, I wanted to give just a little bit of context. So, we're in halfway through the third poem about lament. The first two dealt with, uh, the first one dealt with the preacher's um, perspective and view on suffering. Then the person of Jerusalem, the Lady Jerusalem, um, as she is experiencing the suffering, um, her view uh, of, of herself. Um, the second poem was primarily focusing on God as an actor. God is active and also on his work um, uh, or the, the experience or the passive view of God's, uh, of God's action uh, against Jerusalem. And now, here in chapter 3, we looked through... Um, Kind of coming to the high point, the apex of the Book of Lamentations, and we see um, Jeremiah himself, the prophet, the poet, experiencing the lamentation. Not only is he looking at and seeing the lamentation uh, or the the pain of Jerusalem, but now from a mental standpoint. How does he handle? How does he confront? How does he um, deal with um, the pain and the anguish, the mental pain and anguish of going through or seeing others go through this pain? And I think this is very poignant for us today. You'll see, um, as we talked about um, the, the, just the, the gospel, um, that was presented there in, in last week's section, especially Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 to 30, we see, um, we saw Jeremiah describing the mental anguish that God had caused as he was examining himself. Um, in the first 15 or so uh, verses of chapter 3. Then, um, verses 22 to 30, we see a declaration of consolation based on who God is in the, in the, in the gospel. Um, let's back up and begin reading chapter 3. Remember that it's 66 verses, but it's actually um, pretty close to the same con uh, amount of content in the first two chapters because um, each line has an individual verse attached to it. But the point we're seeing beginning in verse 31 today is we can define a doctrine of pain based on who we believe God is. 
And I think this is extremely important to us um, and to our being able to process pain. Okay? So, Lamentations chapter 3. I'm going to begin verse um, in verse 22. All right? Starting right there in the middle of the chapter and reading down through, it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. We saw how this was pointing to Christ um, specifically. How he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full of reproach. So as we examine Lamentations 3, it brings us to this halfway point in chapter 3. Okay? Let me go back and reiterate what I started out by saying. Hope in doctrine. Um, today, I want us to consider that doctrine is essential for hope. A lot of people see doctrine as divisive, defining, you know. Um, and I have one thing to say about that. First of all, Whenever I use the word doctrine, I'm ta I'm, I mean simply teaching, okay? Doctrine is kind of a straightforward understanding and teaching of what the Bible says. Um, number one. Number two, a straightforward and, if you will, a logical exercise in understanding who God is and what his purpose is, right? So whenever we say that, um, whenever we looked at those verses on who God is, he's good unto them that wait, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that man both hope and quietly wait for the Lord. It is good. So he's defining what is good. And specifically, he is pointing to salvation, to the gospel. All right? So, this uh, process of looking to the gospel, looking at, um, at um, doctrine as a gateway to understanding hope. Um, I wanted to you I, I don't know if you notice, I'm using the metaphor of an anchor here. Um, throughout. And so I want to reference here Hebrews chapter 6 because I think Hebrews chapter 6 gives us um, a strong, clear understanding of the relationship between um, between doctrine and uh, And hope. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 says, We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. All right, so doctrine, doctrine for hope is defining who God is. Therefore, based on that, defining what he does. Therefore, 
based on that, defining how we should understand and react to him. Doctrine is what do we believe, okay? And I believe in a confessional doctrine, all right? So let me define that for just a minute. There, um, all through history, there have been um, groups of believers who have joined together in saying, we believe this is what the Bible teaches. And they will write these confessions, right? Um, one of the oldest ones that is still re um, repeated in many um, churches and even in some hymns that we sing and, and so on is called the Apostles' Creed, right? We believe that God, that there is one God, um, maker of heaven and earth. We believe that he is the creator. Um, we believe that he exists in, in the... Um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that um, Christ is um, eternal God, come down from heaven, uh, born of a virgin, you know, and so on. And we could define, and we could uh, quote the whole creed. I, for some reason, it's slipping my mind at this moment. But believers down through through the last two thousand years have said, "This is what we believe." Okay, there is some benefit. And I don't mean to negate that at all with saying that there is a defined, having a defined um, creed, a defined doctrine, and saying this is what you should believe. All right? That's what we call prescriptive belief. All right? Prescriptive says this is what you ought to to believe, right? It tells you what to believe. You sign your name, yes, I agree with this. When you join a church, a church usually has a statement of faith. When you join and you say, yes, I want to be a part of this people, you are in effect saying, you know, by signing my name here, I believe that this is, um, I agree with what this church stands for. So, um, in the community of believers, there is benefit for um, this kind of creed. But I believe that even stronger than this, and I know this um, is kind of a, a result of American individualism, um, and but there is a sense in which each one of us have to say for ourselves, not only ought I to believe this, but personally, this is what I believe. That's where individual conscience comes in. And a confession, all right, um, this is the way I understand the word confession. A confession should be you not agreeing to some creed, but rather you expressing, I believe this about God. All right? So, Paul is connecting what you believe here with what you hope. Right? In fact, by to say that you believe something and it doesn't affect your life is simply a lie. When you say, I believe this, it should define your life. It should define your, um, your, your experience. It should define your, and in this case particularly, it should define your hope. So, and the hope that we have, the definition of the hope that we have, is based on God's promises. It's taking God at his word, saying, God said this, therefore I believe thus and so. Whenever God made promises to Abraham, what did he do? 
Abraham got up and walked and followed and went to the land of Canaan, even though he, he didn't ever inherit so much as a foot of it. He said, I believe God's promises, and therefore I'm going to um, act based on it. And notice how God's promises work here. Verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Remember how we started out the very first chapter here in Lamentations. God believes in himself. God confesses his own qualities. There is none greater than God, and so he will, he will swear by himself. I am true to myself. I am true to um, what I stand for. I believe that I'm a God of love. I believe I'm a God of grace. I believe I'm a God of justice. And therefore, because of that, um, then I will act on men in, in certain ways. So what did God say? Verse 14, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he, that is Abram, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. What? Abraham's dead. Abraham is in was buried in the cave of Machpelah, there in the land of, uh, of Israel, and it's been overrun. Um, you know, the Israelites have or, and, and have not owned it for many times. So in what sense did Abraham obtain? Well, we know later that Abraham's promise and hope wasn't just the land of Canaan. It wasn't just specifically the the cave of Machpelah. In fact, he believed in a city whose builder and founder was God. And whenever Abram died, he obtained that promise, right? He was in the presence of God. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. You know, when when people say, you know, instead of just giving their word, they say, I swear, right, to make it more effective, they usually swear by something that's more stable than themselves. You know, whether it's, you know, I swear by the Bible, I swear by God, or, you know, and usually, and many times, unfortunately, people use God in vain and don't mean it whenever they use that in that way. But God, whenever he says, I swear by myself, he absolutely means it. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a cons strong consolation. What two things? That's only one. Well, one, God can't fail. Secondly, God can't lie. Right? Um, God is the greatest, and God can't lie. Two immutable things. Two qualities of his personhood that establish that what he says is true. Willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, us, we, who have fled for refuge, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We will one day see justice. We will one day see um, righteousness. We will one day see a, a new heaven and a new earth. We will one day see the kingdom of God come. Lay hold on that hope, brethren. We will one day see all wrongs righted which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Right? It goes all the way in, just as the gospel. It goes all the way in to, to sprinkle the blood before the mercy seat. And so, by the sacrifice of Christ himself, we have a sure and steadfast hope that will anchor us not leave us to wander and be loosened from any sense of stability, which entereth into that within the veil, 
whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And I'm not going to unpack that right now. We're going to continue on in Lamentations. Picking up in verse 31. So, Lamentations... We got to the presentation of the gospel there in those last few verses, right? How Christ, it was a picture of Christ himself. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne the yoke in his youth, right? He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. This is talking about Christ. He put his mouth in the dust, right? He tasted death. For every man, as it says uh, in another place. If so be, there may be hope. He willingly laid his life down. No man took it from him. He laid it down. If he had the power to lay it down, he also had the power to take it up again. He gave his cheek to him that smiteth him. And he is filled full with reproach. Yet for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And so, picking up in verse 31, For the Lord will not cast off forever. So now he's going to make a declaration of, based on who God is, I believe that this is how God is going to operate in my pain, in my problem in my sickness, in my affliction, in my injustice. Based on who God is, based on what we have learned about Him, we can take comfort in that God is going to act in this way. The Lord will not cast off forever. Right? There is hope at the end of the tunnel. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We may go through a period of casting off, or it may appear that we have been cast off, but that casting off will not last forever. It didn't even last forever for Israel, right? He had a des he had a delimited amount of time, and he said, after this, the remnant's coming back. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For and now, based on this understanding, from a broader perspective, backing up, looking at the big picture, we can see, though, when we're dialed in and right in the middle of the affliction, it's extremely painful and extremely consuming of our mind and our uh, awareness. Yet, when we back up for a minute and see it in perspective of the cross, the cross gives us a perspective that there is a limit to the casting off. That there is a compassion that will be extended according to the multitude of his mercies. And then look at this, this, this expression of the, the very heart and ultimate will of God. Verse 33, For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Um, if we were to reference here um, in 1 Peter, right? it says it a little bit differently. But it says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing. So how does the work, will of God work? Well, we can't understand it all. We can't even understand it a, a little bit in terms of how it affects us um, in the moment, right? In time. In the moment of affliction. But we have to believe and this is where personal con confession comes in, that God does not afflict willingly. Right? His, his intent, in verse 34, is not to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. His, his ultimate 
um, attempt is not to turn aside the right of man before the face of the Most High or to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. None, none of these three things, it's not to execute a domineering um, effect over, over men, especially men under his power and under his control. I mean, what can man do, right? If God's all-powerful, and he is, what can man actually do against him? You know, he's just like a slave under God. And yet, rather than domineering over man, God empowers man by giving him grace. And this is through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's been a lot of talk about power and power structures. And, um, and I, this isn't a, a, a good time to, um, to delve all the way into it. But we see here, this is, this is definitely within the context of these verses. Look at what it says. To crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. In just war theory, if, if a country is exercising just war and people surrender and lay down their arms... What is the right and appropriate thing to do? Right? Do you go ahead and kill them all? That's again that's contrary that you know that's where war crimes come in. Right? And so it is with the Lord. These are war crimes because law and a, a and structure of justice and righteousness is, is based on who God is. Right, verse 35, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High. So when man stands before God um, to be judged, um, God's not interested in subverting that justice, right? He's not interested in twisting, in taking occasion to... Um, to um, using his structure to introduce um, information that is not available, rather God deals justly. The Lord doesn't approve of any of these things. He does not approve of injustice. He does not approve of misappropriation or misuse of power. People who are in authority, people who have um, authority, are accountable for the way they use that authority. But notice notice how where God's power lights. Who is he that saith and it cometh to pass when the Lord commanded it not? Right? Can anybody actually contradict God? Can anybody make something happen that God hasn't um ordained? So out of the mouth of the Most High then proceedeth not evil and good. And this is one of the hard sayings, one of the controversies, one of the things that's difficult for us to balance. How God can be good and just and right. How God can be good and loving and at the same time just and right. And how um, evil and good can both seem to come from God. But it's within that understanding of who he is that it begins to make sense. And so you see here the prophet, the poet, wrestling with these ideas. And pain sometimes causes us to stop and reflect and to think through, what do I believe about God? And I think it's a healthy thing to do. Um, I know time is running along, and I hope we get through... Uh, some of this, this is a long section to go through, but let's keep rolling. Verse 39. So based on the doctrine of the way God operates, not only who God is, but how God operates, then what should be our response? What should be our reaction? Verse 39. Wherefore doth a living man complain, and a man 
for the punishment of his sins. Saying just like um, David said in Psalm 51, right? Um, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and mayest be true when thou judgest, right? I was altogether shapen in iniquity. We, um, if we are experiencing anything, we're experiencing less than justice, justice deserves. We're experiencing what, um, what we deserve for the judgment of our lives, for the judgment of our sin. Let's search our ways. So what should our re reaction be? Let's search our ways and try our ways. I'm sorry. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto the God of heaven. That's a picture of prayer. Whenever, it's, whenever you see the, the words um, lifting up your hands or raising your hands in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, starting with Abraham, he lifted up his hands. He said, I have lifted up my hands to the Most High. What is he doing? He's praying. That's a symbol of prayer. The, the high priest, whenever he would intercede for the people, would lift up his hands. Moses, whenever he was praying for the battle that Joshua was leading down in the valley against the Amalekites, Moses held up his hands in a symbol of prayer. We need to pray that God will intervene in our, in our case. God will intervene on our behalf. We have transgressed and we have rebelled, and thou hast not pardoned. Now, in the next few verses, you're going to notice somewhat of a roller coaster. So we started um, last week at the beginning of this chapter talking about the mental breakdown, right? The, the emotions that he was experiencing, the things that he was going through, the mental breakdown. And now... <clears throat> In the midst of the ecstasy of, of his um, seeing the presence of God, seeing the glory of the gospel shining through the midst of his pain, acknowledging his own wrongdoing, yet you have this roller coaster of, of, of up one moment and down the next. You know, of all these different perspectives, just flooding over you and and just um overwhelming and maybe you have experienced that that overwhelming at times of just our emotions first one thing comes to mind and it and you know we're at the bottom and and then the next thing comes up and we're praising God and and raising our hands and shouting hallelujah and then and then another a wave hits us again and we're down in the bo bottom again You know, and so here he comes saying, you know, we're getting what we deserve. And then the next moment he's saying, God, you just won't let up, will you? Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain and thou hast not pitied. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. Here he is quoting that again, that line. Um, you know, that the heaven is, is like, brass right our 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 prayers are just bouncing off the top of the roof thou hast made us as the offscouring and the refuse in the midst of the people we're nothing but a pile of dung you've made us to feel that way the city of jerusalem just a heap after the fire that was experienced just a pile of, of, of stones and rubble. Just the offscour and the refuse in the midst of the people. We're the worst. We're the last. We're the people that all other people despise. I apologize. I have um, to get a power cord. I'll be right back.
Verse 47, fear and a snare has come upon us, desolation and destruction. So down in the depths again, right? God's out for us. God's against us. And what is the effect? Again, broken down. Just a wave of of guilt and shame and pain and anguish just washes over him. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. I feel like I can... I've cried till I can cry no more. I feel like there's no more tears left. Like there's no comfort until God does something. I can't can't just let this go. I can't just move on and go on with my life. Unless God does something, unless God shows himself mighty, I can't keep going. Mine eye affecteth my heart. This was the kind of heart that Christ had. It said over and over again, it said more than once, seeing the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were as sheep without a shepherd. He cried, Christ also cried over the city of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, slayest those that are brought to thee, how oft would I have come, how how oft would I have gathered thee, as a chicken gathereth her, as a hen gathereth her chickens, and you would not. Mine eye affecteth my heart. Is there anything that you see that just breaks your heart? That just, whenever you see how, you know, is it people? Is it individuals? Is it loss of life? Property can be replaced. It's people that make a difference. Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of the daughter's of all the daughters of my city. And then again, mine enemies chase me sore like a bird without cause. They've cut my life in the dungeon and cast stone upon me. Waters flow over my head. Then I said, I am cut off. There's no hope. I mean, at the bottom of this cycle, you know, I don't know if any of y'all have ever been on a big ship in the middle of the ocean. But you're up on the top of the crest and then you go down in the trough and you're like, is there any way out of that again? And it comes up again. Right, the waters flowed over my head and I said, I'm cut off. There's no hope. But even through the storm, weathering through the storm of life, that anchor holds true within the veil what is the veil so yeah we understand it's the veil in the temple but what is that christ through the veil of his flesh what is the veil isn't the veil mortality our mortality i think uh very strongly the veil here is a sense of our human weakness, our human frailty, our susceptibility to death and decay and destruction. Our enemy, remember this, our enemy is not other people. We, a lot of times we think that is the other people that are our, that is our enemy, but our enemy is the devil. He's the one that's going about destroying and seeking to turn people against each other to destroy each other. He is our enemy. He's the one that enjoys division and dissolution. The very word devil means um, uh, means uh, accuser. Verse 
I'm sorry, the word diabolos. The uh, devil comes from uh, the Greek word diabolos. It means an accuser. And Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. So we have to somehow, some way, be able to see past offenses and see that the devil is the one who is actually our enemy. And he is the one that we fight against. And so the fight for, for justice and right is... Uh, it, it, it will involve others. It will involve people. But ultimately, it's the devil. However, the, the this particular poem doesn't end with him down in the bottom, with him overwhelmed. The, the, the very The very waves of the ocean just washing over him comes back out and he says, I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. Thou hast heard my voice, hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidest, now he's dealing directly with God, right? He is confessing, God, this is what I believe. And not only is he confessing it, but he's confessing it in, in the form of a prayer. God, I'm claiming these promises. You promised this, and therefore, I believe you. I trust you. Even though um, it's like riding this roller coaster and, or riding this storm out and holding on for dear life to the mast, and the, the waves are washing over me over and over again, and yet I'm going to keep screaming. I'm going to keep hollering until you hear. Hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidest, Fear not. O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. O Lord, thou hast seen my wrong. Judge thou my cause. And remember that we get a different judgment because of the gospel entering into the equation, right? The gospel made the difference. Therefore, being justified by faith. Abraham was justified. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so we have another verdict. Right? We have a verdict of not guilty. Not in ourselves, but in the gospel of Jesus Christ. O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. What is your confession today? Don't hide it. Don't hoard it. Share it with somebody. O Lord, thou hast seen my wrong. Judge thou my cause. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imaginings against me, all their imaginations against me. Thou hast heard their reproach, O Lord, and all their imaginations against me. The lips of those that rose up against me and their device against me all the day. Behold, they're sitting down and they're rising up. I am their music. Render unto them a recompense, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them sorrow of heart. Thy curse unto them. Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. And so he concludes his statement here in, in, in these terms. In terms of, uh, you know, acknowledging that there are enemies. That there are people who uh, are wishing ill and that they will see their day. I trust that the Lord will add his blessing to these words. Let's pray as we conclude. Father, in these days as we 
do see so much pain, Lord, from so many angles, both from the pandemic and th from, Lord, uh, the financial crisis and from the injustices and from um, un Lord, unruly people and from, Lord, um, hurt feelings and um, misspeaking and uh, so many sources and, Father, sickness and illness and old age, Father, and mortal weakness. So many things as a result of the fall and of the curse. And Lord, we acknowledge you are our God. Christ is our Redeemer. And it's in his name that we pray and we ask, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, hear us. Bring us back together. Thank you for the fellowship of this past Sunday. And would you, as we re convene lord would you guide us as a church that we might grow through this that we might acknowledge you in a greater way and that we might see you work in oral baptist church we know you are working we want to align with your work thank you for what you're doing thank you for giving us a glimpse of what you have done and what you will continue to do. And may that glimpse give us hope to push through, to see the kingdom come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good night and look forward to seeing you Sunday.